Hi guys, Buildzoid here, and uh, today we're going to be taking a look at the Strix X570e gaming from Asus. So it turns out I actually made a mistake with this board, and that's kind of why I'm rushing this video out. Um, and it, when I was doing my video rambling about all the Asus boards, I just assumed, because this uses almost the exact same VRM layout as like all the other freaking Asus boards between $300 and $200, I assumed it was the same VRM. Um, that was a mistake on my, my part. Turns out the VRM on this is extremely similar to the Crosshair 8 Hero, but the thing is, and the feature set is also extremely similar to the Crosshair 8 Hero, but, like, my main complaint for the board was, there's the Strix E, 329. This is from Newegg, like, a couple minutes ago, I just ripped this off a of Newegg. 329, 359, significantly better board. Not much of a price difference. I'm not sure why you'd buy this instead of that. Um, and then on scan, so OCUK doesn't actually even have the Strixie. I assume they came to the same conclusion I came to where it's like, why should we sell this board? This thing doesn't make any sense. But scan does does at least list this thing. Uh, OCUK didn't, so I couldn't get a price comparison from them. But uh, 389 for the Strix, 399 for the Hero. Why does the Strix E exist? Anyway, so... Yeah, like, the, the price point aside, I think the price point on this board just doesn't make any sense as far as, like, why wouldn't you just buy a hero instead of this board? But the board itself is actually not bad, and so, you know, let's let's just dive right into it. We have the extremely unnecessary extra 4-pin as a standard for any... Well, even the low-end boards have the unnecessary 4-pin. I have no idea why. Anyway, um, so here's our V-Core and SOC VRM. Right, and the mistakes I basically made are that I assumed this was still an ASP 1106 for the controller. It's an ASP uh, ASP 1405, um, and I assumed that it was still a bunch of SIC um, 639 power stages from Vichy Semiconductor when it's actually all international rectifier. The VRM still has that funky layout that you'd get on like a Strix F or a Dash Pro or a or a Tough Gaming, where this right here is your SOC VRM. And this is phase, well, this is phase one, that's phase two. And then for V-Core, you have the rest of the VRM where it's like, that's, that's a phase, that's the, that, that one isn't dashed enough. Um, what am I doing? Bam. There, and uh, there. So you get a one, two, three, four, five, six phase V-Core VRM, which the ASP1405 obviously supports. That can run 6 plus 2 just fine because it's probably a rebranded IR35201. Um, and uh, yeah, so, you know, that's Asus's high-end controller. They don't use anything better than an ASP1405. That, that's the best you'll get from them. So no, not really any complaints there. Of course, they're not using any doublers because, uh, you know, Asus likes to... Well, they, they decided to focus on transient response um, with their designs or prioritize transient response in their design and whichever you, <laughs> way you prefer to put it. Um, and basically, doublers do make your transient response potentially a bit worse because they add some delay to the PWM signal. So, you know, Asus basically isn't using... This isn't fully populated. Well, that probably decided that it's not worth it to populate it fully. But anyway, um, <clears throat> yeah, so they aren't using doublers and they're just putting two power stages in each phase in parallel. So essentially you take one PWM signal from your controller and then you just go bam, bam. And that means that these two chips turn on and off at the same time because they're being controlled by the same signal. If you had a doubler, they'd alternately fire, and that would basically reduce your input ripple, your output ripple, and that, that kind of thing. But uh, uh, potentially, those are not priorities in your design, or you can you can also work around like the increased input ripple with just a better input filtering section. So, you know, um, not really anything particularly wrong with doing what Asus is doing here. Um, it, it does reduce the manufacturing cost of the board a bit, but at the same time, it's just like, well, it works. It works just fine. So anyway, um, the end, for the actual power stages, what we're looking at in the SOC VRM, we have a bunch of IR3553s. And I honestly think they should have, like, I think this board would make a lot more sense. It, and, and then for the V-Core, they have IR3555s. So because we, we need context here. We need context. So... Um, for, for my thought about this motherboard. So those are 60 amp uh, POW IR stages. 
from International Rectifier. And uh, you get the same thing with the 3553s uh, are 40 amp pow IR stages. I'm not going to write that out again because it takes me too long. Um, also, why is my pen so fat? There, that's a bit better. Um, so basically what I've been thinking is like this board would make a lot more sense if it wasn't sitting right on top of the, like price wise, it's right on top of the Crosshair 8 Hero. And so I was thinking about like, hey, how could you make this board more reasonable? Well, you could scrap the Strix F, right? You could just remove the Strix F from the, the lineup. And then this thing also has two and a half gig real tech on one of, I think that one's the two and a half gig and that one's the one gig. I might have that backwards. It doesn't really matter. Like they're freaking, you can figure that out. It also has Wi-Fi 6. Um, so, you know, it kind of has all these sort of expensive features. And I kind of feel like they could have just taken the IR3553s and replaced all of the 3555s with those. Yes, that would decrease the efficiency of the VRM. It's not really a big enough deal to matter, right? Like this is very much a VRM in that range of really, uh, really freaking overkill, right? And yes, with the Crosshair 8 Hero, you get more overkill. But I feel like... So they, they could have gone for 3553s everywhere, which would have reduced the cost of the VRM a bit. They could have scrapped the two and a half gig uh, Realtek uh, networking, and uh, they could have put this board at 300 bucks. <laughs> I think that would have made this board much more reasonable because it also has nice features like a postcode. Um, it has BIOS flashback, um, which is hiding somewhere over there. Actually, no, it's this button right here. That button is BIOS flash. So you can update the BIOS of the motherboard without even having a CPU installed. You also have the K-type thermocouple hole in the CPU socket for extreme overclockers. Um, what else is there? There's, I assume, a daisy chain memory layout because daisy chain seems to just work the best with... Uh, um, I mean, like, the thing is, I've already seen several QVLs for X570 where daisy chain boards are doing 4,000 megahertz across 32 gigs of RAM, which makes sense because daisy chain, you know, well... The, the thing is, Daisy Chain has a timing problem, whereas like T-Topology tries to just kind of hide that, um, but in the process ends up being slightly harder to drive overall. Um, but uh, yeah, so, and I've also seen Gigabyte apparently is doing 4,400 megahertz on 32 gigs of RAM with their Daisy Chain. So it's just like, yeah, Daisy Chain seems to just work just fine for the, the Ryzen third gen memory controller. Um, and anyway, so this is probably going to be, and as far as I know, all of the, the Asus boards should be daisy chain. Also, like this generally has to, like this is generally a daisy chain requirement, though there are some T topologies that also have this kind of requirement. Um, and this should be daisy chain, so it'll prefer these two dim slots if you're running two sticks, and if you're running four sticks, well, you, you have to fill it out completely. Uh, four by eight seems to have better support than two by eight across most motherboard, I mean, two by 16. Um, across most motherboards just because this is a far easy like these are far more common memory sticks so the board vendors care about having them functioning more um, you also have the troubleshooting leds over here and i just realized i got really distracted from the vrm but i don't have that much time to shoot the video so we're just gonna randomly transition back to that um, the optimum thing the optimum thing i think that's just marketing like, I wouldn't pay too much attention to it because to me, this is just, oh, yeah, Asus came up with a silly marketing name for their memory layout, whereas nobody else bothers to do that because it's silly. Actually, no, MSI has their DDR4 boost thing, which is kind of the same idea as like Optimum, where it's just like, ooh, a silly marketing name for just doing your memory layout yourself instead of using some off the shelf design. That might not be the best. Um, so, yeah. Um, Anyway, so daisy chain memory layout, it should work completely fine and in, in, even into like, well, in the frequency range that you actually care about for daily usage with Ryzen, which is like 3600 or 3733 megahertz, it just doesn't matter how, what kind, like T topology doesn't really give you an advantage. Um, so I would just kind of ignore it. Even on four dims, it's just like 3600 does not require a T topology on a four dim configuration. Um, so that's kind of that. Um, we do have the color coded troubleshooting LEDs. And at this point, we can go back to the VRM, sh should, shouldn't we? So efficiency-wise, this is actually on par with the MSI Meg Ace board. Um, and uh, yeah, so 1.2 volt, because the Meg Ace is, of course, 12 power stages, and this is also 12 power stages. So I'm ignoring the fact that if you had doublers, you could slightly improve the efficiency of the VRM, because it really is very, very slightly. So... 
400 kilohertz switching frequency, 5 volts drive. And at this point, we're going to do, so 100 amps output, you're going to be looking at about 11 watts of heat, which that's like a first gen, second gen, well, no, first or third gen 8 core CPUs will pull about that 100 amps. So the VRM doesn't even need a heatsink for that kind of current output whatsoever. Uh, 150 amps output, that's going to be like a 3900X under Prime 95 with small FFTs and just absolutely, you know, wailing on it with the V-Core as well. Um, you're going to be looking at about 15 watts of heat. You still don't need a heat sink. Um, a 2700X actually falls in between these two, so at a, about 125 amps. But if you run high voltage on a 2700X, you can also get it to like almost 150. Um, anyway, it's just that if you're pushing that much voltage into a 2700X, that chip will be degrading relatively quickly. Um, 200 amps output, you're going to be looking at about uh, 19 watts of heat. Um, and that's for like a that that is theoretically where the 16 core will land in like prime 95 uh, with AVX small FFTs again. So that would be about 200 amps. Um, the VRM still doesn't really need a heatsink very much. So yeah, the, the, the VRM on this is really, really like it's great. But the thing is, I just feel like for a little bit more money, you can just get a Crosshair 8 Hero, which is just better in every way. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure why, why this board exists. Like, there's nothing wrong with it. It just seems like really not well, pri like, the, the price doesn't really seem very reasonable. Uh, 300 amps output, you're going to be looking at about 30 watts of heat, which this is like extreme overclocking territory only. Then 400 amps output, again, extreme overclocking territory only. So, like, liquid nitrogen, that kind of thing. 48 watts of heat and then 500 amps, which is where I just arbitrarily draw the line for what I'm bothered to, to go up to with my uh, current ratings. The VRM will produce about 70 watts of heat. So this right here, that needs a heat sink. This needs a heat sink and a significant amount of airflow. This is not really practical, but it would like if you had a water block on the VRM, you could still do that, right? Like that's not that high of heat output that you couldn't cool it. It's just that it becomes impractical to try cool with the... Uh, with a air cooling type solution. So yeah, you know, VRM on this is absolutely great. It's just that the price point of this motherboard doesn't make any sense as far as I'm concerned. That That's really my only complaint for it is just like 389, 399. And this gets a seven plus one VRM and just more overclocking features in general. Whereas, and yeah, it's just, okay, so you lose the Wi-Fi six, but I feel like I don't know. I feel like there should be more of a price gap between two, these two boards. And I feel like the way Asus could have achieved that is if they just removed the two and a half gig LAN and downgraded the VRM a bit. And that, that I think would have made for an overall more interesting motherboard because they'd have a cheaper offering with the postcode, right? Because like that's kind of the like the highlight for me with this board is not so much the VRM. It's the fact that you get a postcode, but you can get boards with postcodes for less than this. Like there's the X570 Tai Chi. Um, which, uh, yes, you lose the two and a half gig LAN, but you get a postcode and it's much cheaper. So yeah, I'm, that's, that's basically why I'm not a fan of this board is just like the price, po price point doesn't really make a ton of sense. Um, but other than that, like, it's not a bad board, just not very, um, I don't know. It just, yeah, price doesn't make a ton of sense in my opinion. We already were on the back of the board, um, so yeah, there's not really much to see here. Asus is doing a ground fill over the memory traces on the back, or maybe all the memory traces are in like the on the other side of the board. Um, so they're not doing the thing where like MSI actually has a ground fill on top of their memory layout as well as on the back of the board. And interestingly enough, Gigabyte isn't bothering to do anything um, with, with this kind of thing, but I'm not sure how much impact that has in reality. So, you know, it's just like, we'll, we'll see, like, that's one of those things is like, yeah, you can, you can look at what's kind of going on with the memory layout, but ultimately you just have to test it. That's very much one thing you just have to test. And I'd say the VRM is the same situation, except the VRM is an absolute nightmare to do comparisons between boards because like your software voltage readings are not reliable not across different board vendors, not like actually not even across different motherboard SKUs from the same vendor. It's just like only with it. Like, so yeah, it's just, um, yeah, that, that's, th there's a few things that you absolutely have to test. Um, but, uh, th this board's not like, there's nothing really particularly wrong with this board. Just the price point is kind of ridiculous. Oh, and I forgot to take a look at the VRM heatsink. 
So there's our heat sink. Nothing super, like super high surface area or anything like that. But at the same time, like as I said, for normal loading, this VRM doesn't really need a heat sink in the first place. So this is going to be more than plenty for the kind of heat output that this VRM is going to be running, even with a 3950X, right? So yeah, um, it really like, you know, doesn't have that much surface air. Well, it could be a lot worse. <laughs> and, you know, we do have like the, the shelf fins like that. And then obviously this top one and that. So yeah, decent amount of surface area, but you could obviously get a heatsink design has that has way more surface area. It's just that it wouldn't really do anything because the VRM doesn't really like, there's no real reason to bother with like a super thermally efficient heatsink design when your VRM is this like this freaking efficient. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of that. That's the Strix E. Whoa, this video is short. Um, how, how did I manage that? 15 minutes for a motherboard PCB breakdown. So yeah, that's the, that's the X570 Strix, uh, I mean Strix X570-E gaming from Asus. It's a perfectly good board, except for the part where it competes too closely in price tag with the Crosshair 8 Hero. And also you could, also you could just look at a lot of like, because there are motherboards that are in the same category in terms of like performance as the Crosshair 8 Hero, as well as features. Like say the X570 Master from Gigabyte or the, um, um, the X570, like the Tai Chi actually, if you don't care about the two and a half gig real tech, there's the Tai Chi of course, which I think is um a really interesting board there's the Me well the meg ace is actually one of the more expensive boards in this price range so yeah like th this board's going up again like it it's too close to that you know really what i consider the very overkill x570 motherboards where you just kind of get everything you could ever want with your board um range and and price wise this is not far from that and it doesn't have everything like yes it, it added the postcode and it has like 95% of what you need in a mother, like 95% of what I'd want in a motherboard. But I feel like they could have, you know, maybe chopped down the VRM, chopped off the two and a half gig and made it cheaper. Um, I think that would have been more, much more reasonable as a motherboard. So yeah, that's the Strix X570-E Gaming. Thanks for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comment section below. And if you'd like to support what I do here with uh, actually hardcore overclocking, I have a Patreon. There's also Teespring. You can buy shirts, posters, hoodies, stickers all on Teespring. There's a link in the description down. Down in the description below, there's a link to that. And for Patreon, is if you don't want to buy anything, you can just support me directly through Patreon. So that's it for the video. Thanks for watching and goodbye.